research is on conceptual development and social cognition, and I take a developmental perspective, including collecting data from children, uh, empirical data from children and parents and how they talk together uh, to understand how language uh, contributes to conceptual development, how children, a uh, key question I'm interested in is how children develop their sort of basic conceptual framework that they rely on to make sense of the social world and how all of that can contribute to social stereotyping. So you might be kind of wondering or um, maybe even hesitant a bit to think about uh, why is it necessary to take a developmental perspective on this? Why is it gonna be interesting to look at data from children, from young children and how children and parents talk together? So I just wanna address that as sort of a starting point uh, for the talk today and for my work in general by noting uh, that stereotypes develop really early in childhood um, with immediate and long-term consequences um, for a wide range of, of behavioral, academic, and health-related outcomes. So you know, how young is really young um, and what kinds of stereotypes are we talking about? Well, by at least age three, between ages three and six, children develop gender stereotypes, for example, about a really wide range of things. So by age three, they already have ideas about who should play with what kind of toy and wear what kind of clothes and prefer what kind of color. By age four, we already start to see the beginning of some academic stereotypes, such as the idea that boys are better suited to science and girls are better suited to reading, for example. Um, by age five, at least, they also start to show stereotypes about social behavior and emotional capacities. So thinking, for example, that boys are more aggressive and girls are more cooperative. And by age six, which is when many kids start formal schooling, you see a wide range of gender stereotypes um, start to emerge, including the idea that boys are better at math, that boys have sort of more in general innate potential or innate genius uh, for academic subjects. Um, as well as that boys are better suited to be leaders and girls are better suited to be part of a team. So all of these beliefs are starting to develop very early in childhood, which is problematic because it means those stereotypes can interfere with children's behavior and their learning before it even has a chance to get off the ground. So if you can imagine a young child, a young girl starts kindergarten already thinking that boys are more likely uh, to be better at science, this might discourage her from engaging with science before she even has a chance to try it out. So in that way, because we know that stereotypes directly interfere with behavior, um, the fact that they emerge early and can sort of immediately change children's behavior in school context and how they interact with people and so on. Those early processes can have kind of cascading effects across development and ultimately be one contributor to the kinds of gender disparities that we still observe in adulthood. Um, I'm gonna be talking a lot about gender stereotypes today, although I think a lot of what I'm talking about is generalizable to stereotypes based on other kinds of social categories as well. And I'd be happy to discuss that in the Q&A. And so for these reasons that stereotypes develop so early and have these immediate and long-term consequences for development, I think uh, it's important to study children. So to understand how stereotypes arise um, in everyday life, and then especially how they might be prevented. So how we might intervene on some of those processes so that children develop more adaptive ways of making sense of the world that don't contribute so much to stereotyping. We have to consider the processes that are taking place uh, when this all actually unfolds, which is in early childhood. So that's kind of the starting point for my work in this area. So today I'm gonna to suggest that to understand how all of these things happen, and what we might perhaps be able to do about them, we're gonna sort of focus on understanding three things. Uh, this is the outline of the talk. So we're gonna focus on understanding the nature of widespread conceptual representations of social categories uh, and how they might contribute to the development and maintenance of social stereotypes. Uh, then we'll look at how language contributes to the development of those concepts um, initially. And then we might consider how, what we know about those concepts and what we know about the role of language could be harnessed, uh, perhaps for social good. So if we know how language contributes to problematic concepts that contribute to social stereotypes, could we use language differently uh, in a way that might have more positive consequences? So this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about today, and I'll be presenting a lot of empirical work, especially um, on the second two pieces. Uh, but first, to talk a little bit about the kinds of conceptual representations that my work has focused on, my work looks a lot at essentialist representations of social categories, how those uh, essentialist representations develop and their implications for social cognition and behavior. 
So most people here are probably uh, somewhat familiar with the concept of psychological essentialism. Uh, here, you know, in contrast to some other forms of essential, I just want to clarify, I'm not talking about any kind of metaphysical essentialist claim. I'm only talking about people's tendency to believe um, essentialist ideas about the structure of the world, um, which are inaccurate and don't reflect the actual structure of the world, but we're interested in people's beliefs about the world nonetheless. So uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'll start with a bit of a definition of psychological essentialism. So psychological essentialism is a set of intuitions about how we think about many everyday categories. So essentialism is what leads us to believe that this adorable baby tiger will inevitably grow up to be this ferocious tiger. Do we think he has this, this ferocious tiger essence inside, even though that ferocious behavior can't be observed at birth, which will lead him to sort of inevitably become a ferocious tiger later. We tend to believe that a baby, adorable baby tiger will grow up to be a mean, ferocious adult tiger, even if he grows up in a community surrounded with friendly sheep. So we don't think of this as a learned behavior, but something that's part of its innate potential by being born to tiger parents. We assume that all tigers will grow up to be ferocious or that tigers will usually at least grow up to be ferocious, even if they look kind of unusual. They don't look like a typical tiger, but we know they are a tiger. We still expect them to have the tiger behavior. And we don't apply this expectation to other animals, no matter how tiger-like they might appear at first glance. Okay, so those are all essentialist intuitions. We can understand all of those beliefs that we hold about categories like tigers by suggesting that people view category memberships as determined by some kind of intrinsic essence, which is obtained by natural processes that usually occur before birth, is stable across development, and then causes the development of category typical properties. So again, this is not meant to be any kind of claim about the actual structure of biological categories or social categories, but instead it's a description of how people often think about biological categories and social categories. In cognitive and developmental psychology, essentialist beliefs have most often been studied in the case of animal categories to make sense of things like intuitive biology. But it's also the case that people hold essentialist, uh, people and including young children hold essentialist beliefs about um, some social categories as well, um, especially gender categories. So as illustrated here, gender essentialism is the belief that a baby who is born a girl will remain a girl, will inevitably grow up to show girl typical properties, even though very few of those tendencies are actually present at birth. And again, that's of course a completely inaccurate way of understanding gender, but nevertheless, gender essentialist intuitions are widespread among parents, among young children, and um, across populations more generally. Okay. Um, so those kinds of essentialist beliefs, uh, especially about social categories, have been found uh, in work in developmental and social psychology to have a range of negative consequences for social cognition um, and intergroup relations more generally. So social essentialism has been found uh, to promote social stereotyping. Um, I'm going to present a little bit of empirical data on this um, a little bit later on in the talk. But in prior work, it's been found that when people have more essentialist beliefs about a category like gender, they also endorse more gender stereotypes about that kind. And that when you induce essentialist beliefs about a novel social category, people tend then to be more ready to accept social stereotypes about that group. And the link between essentialism and stereotyping, there's a number of ways to think about it. Um, and again, we'll get into this in a little more detail later. But there are ways to think about it that are conceptually very straightforward. So part of essentialism is assuming that members of a category share an underlying reality that causes them to have many properties in common with one another. So it's not a very big, in some ways that is a form of stereotyping, assuming that something that's true of one category member will necessarily generalize to another category member. So the cognitive processes implicated in essentialism are very similar to those that we think of or identical to those that we think of in stereotyping. It's also the case that um, essentialism entails believing there's a causal connection between the category uh, and the feature. And that kind of causal uh, belief is often central to stereotyping as well. So you don't, people don't just generally think that boys are better at math than girls are. They think there's something about a boy that makes them better at math. So in some ways, stereotyping, something inherent to a boy that makes them better at math. So in some ways, stereotyping and essentialism um, are, you know, stereotyping is maybe describing a component of exactly what essentialism does. 
Um, okay, so and that's stereotyping is mostly what I'm going to talk about today. But it's also the case that social essentialism, just to note, has a number of other negative implications for social cognition and intergroup relations as well. So it's been found, to, not always, but sometimes to relate to increased prejudice, especially against low status groups. And this tends to happen when people particularly have an essentialist intuition about the status disparity itself. So if you think a group in your society is lower status because they are inherently uh, disposed to have lower status, that is really a direct reflection of a prejudice belief and, and can contribute um, to the development of prejudice and intergroup bias. And then essentialism has also been found to inhibit positive intergroup relations. So when people have more essentialist beliefs about a group that they're not a part of, they've been found to be less interested in interacting with members of that group. So social essentialist beliefs are clearly inaccurate, but also widespread and have a number of negative implications for social cognition and intergroup relations. Okay, so that's a little bit on the first part, the sort of conceptual representation that I'm interested in here, because it has negative implications for stereotyping and these other things that I've mentioned about is our essentialist representations of social categories. So now I want to ask, how does language contribute to the development of those essentialist representations of social categories so that we can then think about how could language be used differently to perhaps instead promote not or less essentialist, uh, either totally anti-essentialist or less essentialist representations of categories to begin with. So the language that we focused on in my lab uh, quite a bit are generic references to social categories. Generic references, here's a bunch of examples um, of generic references to gender. So these include things like boys play baseball, a boy doesn't cry, boys love to wrestle, girls wear pink, girls don't like math, girls have long hair, and so on. So many people are probably familiar uh, with generics. Uh, what's important here is that they are describing not any particular individuals, not a subset of the category, not a quantified set of the category, uh, but something that we think is sort of generally true of the abstract category that's being mentioned. So people use generics to describe what they think of as characteristic and distinctive about the category, um, but they don't necessarily imply that all and every, or every member of the category has the property. They are very permissive of exceptions and so on. Generics are very common in a uh, parent-child conversation about categories, and for that reason, they're kind of a plausible mechanism for the transmission of essentialist beliefs about those categories, because they refer to categories as abstract and coherent kinds. Um, so the, the basic idea, and then I'll get into some more detail about how this works, the basic proposal in thinking about how generics work in the context of conversations that children might be having is that from hearing a bunch of sentences like these, children learn more than about who plays baseball and who's supposed to cry and who likes to wrestle and who wears different colored clothing and so on and so on. They also learn that speakers in their community think these categories are meaningful and real. So they recognize linguistically that a generic refers to an abstract kind and not to a specific individual or a subset. They can then sort of infer that the speaker thinks of this as an abstract and coherent kind uh, of people and then kind of adopt that view of categories themselves. This category must be real and informative and determined in some natural, real way what the members are like, or these speakers that I'm interacting with wouldn't be referring to it as if it does. So what I'm focusing on a lot here is how generics work in, and are understood in the context of communication. And that's an important part of the proposal because it's certainly not the case that generics create essentialist thought or explicitly communicate essentialist thought. So there are lots of interpretations of all of these generics, like girls like pink, girls play house, girls have long hair, that are consistent with many not essentialist interpretations. So uh, someone could very well think girls play house because they're taught to play house. Girls have long hair because hairdressers don't like to cut girls' hair short. They could have lots of extrinsic, uh, even structural explanations for these kinds of sentences. But what I'm going to suggest to you empirically is that that doesn't tend to be the default way that children understand them because of how they understand what speakers are kind of trying to communicate when they use this linguistic form. This kind of language feeds into the, the conceptual development system in a way that gives rise to essentialist representations, even um, though that wouldn't necessarily have to be the case, and even when it's the case that it might 
might not be what the speaker actually explicitly intends. So just to talk through that communicative process a little more in detail before I show you some data on this, the basic idea here is that in the context of a parent-child conversation, a dad says something here like boys love trucks. The first thing to know about young children and how they're going to understand a sentence like that is that by very young, by at least age two and a half, they recognize a generic and they distinguish it from other types of speech about categories. So they know the generic refers to a kind and not to a specific individual or a subset. So that sort of linguistic understanding is in place quite young. They know it refers to an abstract kind, not a particular exemplar or set of exemplars. Children also expect knowledgeable adults to be knowledgeable speakers and to refer to categories in the world the way they are supposed to be referred to. And in fact, children rely on this kind of deference to experts uh, that in thinking that parents and other knowledgeable people in their environment know how to talk about categories, even over sort of their own perception in many cases. So they will adopt the category labels that they hear people around them use, even if something looks to them like it should be a member of a different category. And so from this, the proposal is that if they recognize that the parent is referring to the abstract kind boy, they will assume the abstract kind boy really exists in some coherent, meaningful, objective way in the world um, because a knowledgeable speaker is referring to it as if it does. They also understand that people choose their words intentionally and could have said otherwise. So, for example, the kid can know that the parent could have said boys and girls love trucks or kids love trucks or Jimmy loves trucks or this boy loves trucks or whatever, and chose to say boys love trucks, uh, meaning that the parent is trying to communicate something distinctive and important about the kind boy. And so because of all of the other linguistic and pragmatic and conceptual inferencing abilities that young children have quite early on, they can um, interpret parents' generics as implying the, the existence of these real kinds of things in the world, these real categories. Okay. So that way of thinking about how generics work in the context of communication leads to a number of unique predictions that we can test empirically. One is that the linguistic form of these sentences is going to matter on its own uh, beyond the content that it communicates about categories. And another is that children's interpretation of these sentences is going to depend on their beliefs about speaker knowledge and intention. Uh, so I'm going to show you some data that speaks to both of these, uh, starting with the first point. So what's the empirical evidence that children are tracking the linguistic form of a generic um, that it leads to essentialism and that this has something to do with the linguistic form on its own. So we've studied these questions in a couple of different ways, including experimental studies, teaching children about novel categories, and then also some natural language studies that look at how parents and children actually talk about categories and how that relates to the development of kids' beliefs. So I'm going to draw on both types of research um, to illustrate this point. Okay, so in our experimental research, um, we've introduced kids to a novel category called Zerpes. And we created this category of Zerpes uh, to be perceptually diverse. Uh, so the members of the category are diverse with respect to apparent age and race and gender. They have this kind of characteristic way of dressing, but no single defining feature, even in their clothing. And each person is always representing, represented doing one idiosyncratic behavior. So they see one Zarpy that seems to hate ice cream, one that eats flowers, all these kinds of sort of strange things. And the idea with this, this was done purposefully uh, to make Zarpies look a little bit more like, well, a, a little bit like an odd group, but also like an ad hoc group. So that we don't show multiple Zarpies doing these things. We don't show them doing things that are similar to one another. We don't show them looking like one another. And children, although essentialist beliefs develop early in childhood, children um, hold those beliefs quite selectively for social capital. Categories. So they've used some categories like gender often in essentialist terms, but there are many other social groupings like classroom groupings and teams and so on that they don't represent in essentialist terms. So our idea here was to create a category that they would not initially think of in essentialist terms. They wouldn't in initially think, oh, all, all those properties are determined by birth and stable and Zarpies are likely to have many other things in common with one another as well. We wanted to avoid them starting with that idea just based on what they looked like. And then we can test if a little bit of language, in particular generic language, is sufficient to lead them to start to hold an essentialist representation of Zarpies, 
when they wouldn't hold one otherwise. So that's the goal of the of this initial experimental paradigm. I'm going to show you kind of the initial baseline experiment and then a few other more recent ones that isolate the role of linguistic form um, in some more detail. So in um, the basic paradigm, children are this, I'm, I'm going to show you some data from a recent conceptual replication we did of some of our earlier work, um, which was led by my graduate student, Rachel Leshen. And uh, the participants were children who participated from across the United States and the United Kingdom through our online lab for virtual, uh, virtual developmental research. And they were introduced to Zarpies through a storybook. So they are going to see a book of 16 Zarpies presented one at a time. Uh, and it looks like this. And I think the sound should work. But if there's an issue, just let me know. All about Zarpies. Sound is Look okay. at this zarpy. The zarpies love to eat flowers. Look at this zarpy. The zarpies have stripes in their hair. Okay, so they just see... Look at this zarpy. They just see 16 pages like that. Each one presents an individual zarpy. They hear, look at this zarpy, and then they hear the property described generically. Zarpies bounce a ball on their head. In the comparison condition in this experiment, they see all the same uh, visual stimuli, same 16-page book, but they just hear each one described non-generically. Look at this Zarpy. Look at this Zarpy. This Zarpy loves to eat flowers. Look at this Zarpy. This Zarpy has stripes in her hair. Okay. So after they go through the 16 page book, which is um, particular to which condition they're in, participants are randomly assigned to a generic condition or a specific condition. They then complete a series of test items that are designed to assess the extent to which they're now thinking of the category in essentialist terms. We had several different measures of essentialism. I'm just gonna show you a few of them. So one of them looks at whether they attribute an individual Zarpy's behavior to something idiosyncratic and extrinsic about that particular Zarpy or to something more intrinsic that's shared across members of the kind, which would be consistent with a more essentialist view of the category. So here's what an item like that might look like. Look at this Zarpy. He really doesn't like walking in the mud. Hmm, let's think about why this Zarpy might really not like walking in the mud. Do you think it's because a lot of Zarpies are afraid of mud, or because he doesn't want to get his shoes dirty? Because he doesn't want to get his shoes dirty. So that side. So in that That's case, right. the kid is attributing the behavior to something specific about that Zarpy. So that would be a non-essentialist response about the category. Here's another example item. This is testing whether kids think that it's inevitable and necessary for Zarpies to do the properties that they heard described generically, or if they think um, that a Zarpy could do something else as well. There's nothing in the sentence Zarpies sleep in tall trees that, for example, that implies directly that they can't also sleep in a bed sometimes, um, but we're testing the extent to which children assume that is the case based on the language that they heard. Look at this Zarpy. This Zarpy sleeps in a tall tree. Do you think the Zarpy might sometimes sleep in a bed too, or only in a tree? So in that case, the kid gave um, the more essentialist response that being a member of the category would mean you have to do the category properties. You can't just choose to do otherwise. So again, children completed three different measures of essentialism and were testing to see whether having heard some properties initially described with generic language subsequently leads children to have endorse more essentialist views of the category. And we found that to be the case. So the orange here is the generic condition and the purple is the specific condition from the storybook phase. The y-axis is the probability of selecting the essentialist response across all of our different test items and children's exact age from five to nine on the x-axis and you can see that at each age uh children who heard more who heard generic language about the category subsequently endorsed more essentialist views um so that effect is reliable statistically and consistent across age you also see that essentialist beliefs in general increased across age um, in this project you might see that that effect is still is you know reliable but not huge and it's definitely not the case that children are endorsing overwhelmingly or completely essentialist views of therapies 
But I think that it, I mean, that is what we initially expected. And I think it's intuitive that that should be expected. They start the study having never heard of Zarpies before. Zarpies were designed to look kind of like an ad hoc and idiosyncratic group, not one that you would initially have essentialist beliefs about. And the kids in this particular project um, heard only 16 examples of generics. Um, so we were really testing as kind of a proof of concept here. Can hearing a little bit of generic language be sufficient to start children to develop essentialist views? If, and I'll show you some data along these lines in a few moments, you think about the amount of generics children might hear in daily life about something related to gender, for example, then you can imagine those kinds of linguistic effects compounding over time. Um, okay. So you might have noticed many things besides linguistic form, the form of the generic that varied in that initial experiment. Um, for example, the uh, generics in that one were all bare plural generics. So they're also con uh, um, communicating sort of directly the idea that the property is shared across at least more than one member. We run some other experiments that compared um, specific language like this Zarpy uh, loves to eat flowers with indefinite singular generics, and those show a very similar pattern, but we also have tried to find some other ways to look experimentally um, at the role of linguistic form on its own. So one way, which I will just sort of summarize instead of um, showing you all the experimental details, but you can look at this recently published paper if you want to read more about this work, um, was led by my uh, former graduate student, Emily Foster Hansen, who looked at how children respond to negated generics. So in this case, children would hear a conversation between two characters about the novel group of Zarbies. And they saw a few people at the beginning and said, like, here are these four people, these are all Zarbies, and that's all the perceptual input that they got about Zarbies throughout the entire study. For the rest of the study, they had these two characters that were looking um, at a book about Zarbies, but the kids couldn't actually see the book. And they were disagreeing about the nature of Zarpies. So one of them would say, you know, oh, look at that Zarpies, Zarpies have striped hair. And in one of the conditions, the other one would look and say, oh, no, that's not right about Zarpies. So, and then they would happen again. Oh, look at that Zarpies, Zarpies hate flowers. Oh, no, that's not right about Zarpies. So in the end, the children didn't learn any of the shared features of any shared features of Zarpies because these people were just disagreeing. Children had no idea what Zarpies had in common with one another at the end. But they did still hear two speakers talk about generics, uh, talk about Zarpies generically. So the two speakers seem to agree that Zarpies are a kind and that they're both referring to it generically but they seem to disagree about the properties that are shared distinctively across members of that kind. So that's what that condition communicated. And then in the other condition, they would instead hear, oh, look, the Zarpies have striped hair. And the other person would say, oh no, this Zarpie has striped hair. Oh, look, Zarpies hate flowers or eat flowers. <laughs> no, look, this Zarpie eats flowers. So in that case, they actually learn about the property of at least one Zarpy, that one Zarpy has striped hair, that another Zarpy hates flower, eats flowers, and so on. But in this case, the speakers actually seem to be disagreeing about whether it's appropriate to use language to imply that features are shared across the kind, because one speaker is saying Zarpy, Zarpy, Zarpies, and the other one is saying, no, this Zarpy, this Zarpy, this Zarpy. So in that case, it does not seem to be a, a shared belief across the two characters that it makes sense to refer to the category generically. And so what we found there was that children had subsequently endorsed more essentialist views about Zarpies in the negated uh, condition where the two speakers spoke about the category using generics. So when they heard Zarpies have striped hair, no, that's not right about Zarpies, they subsequently endorsed more essentialist views of the category, even though they didn't actually learn about any features that the members of the category had in common with one another. So that's some evidence that just hearing speakers use the generic form, even if it doesn't communicate anything useful about what the category members have in common, is sufficient to elicit essentialist beliefs in young children. Another way that we've tried to isolate the role of the linguistic form here is by varying the sort of the explicit essentialist content of what is being communicated. And so this is another project led by some of my graduate students, Josie Benitez and Rachel Leshin, where we found that generics lead to essentialism even if they describe social mechanisms of transmission. So we did this using the same set of Zarpies. In the original study that I showed you, we just said 
generics, like Zarfis have striped hair. And we didn't say anything about why. And, and so when children are assuming that it's because they're born Zarfis, so they have to have striped hair, perhaps because of something genetic or something like that, that's an inference that they're making about what gave rise to the commonality that's being described by the generics. Uh, so here we were interested in making that a little bit more explicit and see if it mattered and also see if it mattered or would block the processes if we use generics but actually said content that was anti-essentialist. So they have striped hair because they're taught to paint stripes in their hair, for example, which is a mechanism that can explain the category of irregularity without appealing to an intrinsic cause. So it's an anti-essentialist or a counter to essentialist explanation for why category members share features. So this condition crossed two manipulations uh, with each other. So we had a linguistic manipulation, a language form manipulation. So some children heard uh, generics, Zarpies have stripes in their hair. Others heard specifics, this Zarpie has stripes in her hair. But then we also manipulated the causal information that children were given to explain that regularity. So in the biological condition, we gave them explicitly essentialist content. Zarpies are born that way. And in the social condition, we gave them information that was counter to essentialism. Zarpies are taught to paint strikes in their hair. And we crossed that with linguistic form to create four conditions. And uh, everything else about the experiment was similar to what I showed you before. It was conducted in the virtual lab in the same way. And so this is collapsing for a moment across the causal information because we found no statistically reliable mean or interactive effects of causal of the causal information we provided on how kids responded. So at, in this experiment, we found that children ages five through eight endorsed more essentialist views about Zarpies when they learned about Zarpies with generics than with specifics regardless of the causal information, whether they were told that those regularities were brought about by biological or social mechanisms. Um, and just to show you it's split by condition, uh, just descriptively, you can see that the pattern appears stronger in the biological origins condition. So when they're told Zarpies are born that way, they seem to have more essentialist beliefs um, but but uh, you still see the effect of generic language, even when those generics are communicating information counter to essentialism. So they're taught to do this. They're not born this way. You still see the effect of linguistic form there. And again, statistically, uh, these conditions were identical to one another. Now, this is particular to children. So you might be thinking these results are surprising. And for adults, they were. Th th this is not what happened among adults. So adults were very sensitive to the type of causal mechanism that we described and had more essentialist beliefs for the most part in the biological condition um, than in the cultural condition. It's just that children were tracking linguistic form more than the content of the sentence. Okay, so that is some experimental evidence that the generic sort of sends a powerful signal to children, uh, which often leads them to develop essentialist views of the category. Before I move on to the second piece on um, of this of this account, which looks at the role of speaker knowledge and intention, I also want to show you some data that are consistent um, with the important role of linguistic form that draws on some natural language data from parents and kids instead of experimental manipulations. So generic references to gender, as I mentioned, are very common in parent-child conversation about gender, especially in the preschool years, which is when we see essentialist beliefs about gender first start to emerge. So we recently conducted a natural language study, again, led by my graduate students here with families participating from across the United States, where we asked, we, we gave them stimuli that we thought would prompt conversations uh, about gender. And we recorded about 20 minutes of parents and kids having those conversations. We did that in one session, transcribed and quoted everything that they said. And then in other sessions, uh, measured children's essentialist beliefs about gender and their stereotypes so that we could see a variation in how parents talked about gender predicts variation uh, in how children think about gender in the same manner that we would expect it to given our experimental findings. So to do this, we gave them a picture book uh, that didn't actually use any gender labels at all, but it prompted gender talk about gender because we showed stereotypical and counter stereotypical examples. So we had pages like this that said, who puts on makeup? And uh, they, here they're seeing a counter stereotypical example of a man putting on makeup. 
uh, on other pages, they would see stereotypical examples, for example, of like a woman taking care of a baby or something like that. We had different versions of the book. So what, what family saw a stereotypical or counter stereotypical varied across participants and so on. And we just asked them to discuss this um, any way they would talk about a picture book as they normally would with their child. So here's an example of this parent and child talking about this book. Oh, what is that guy doing? Do boys put makeup on? Yeah. No, but can they? Yeah. Yeah. Do we put makeup on Sam and Daddy? Yeah. Yeah. Boys put on makeup. Okay. So this is a useful example to consider in this context because um, you can pull apart the content from what she's seeing from the form and ask some different questions about that. So she ends here with a counter stereotypical message, boys can wear makeup. Um, so she's explicitly communicating to her child this counter stereotypical idea, but she's still using um, the generic form to communicate that. So if in general children are tracking generic references to gender in what their parents say, even though she's expressing counter stereotypical content, she could be sort of signaling that gender is an essential way of dividing up people and kind of fostering the development of a stereotypical way of thinking about gender, even though that is not what she seems to explicitly intend to do in this example. So I hope that kind of illustrates the point and that's what our coding captured. It captured the, the linguistic form that parents use to talk about gender, as well as the content of what they were seeing as it relates to stereotypes and so on. We then later measured um, children's essentialist beliefs about gender, uh, including the extent to which they thought uh, gender properties are determined by birth or by the environment. So here's what an item like that looks like. Look, here's a picture of a baby boy named Zillow. Right after Zillow was born, Zillow went to go live with his aunt and girl cousins and became part of the aunt's family. Zillow grew up with his aunt and girl cousins, and there weren't any boys or men who lived with them. Zillow even went to a special school with only girls, so he only played with girls and never played with other boys. Now that Zillow is a big kid, does Zillow like to play with a tea set, or does Zillow like to play with a toy truck? Sure. Okay, so that kid is saying the baby was born a boy. Doesn't matter that the child grew up entirely surrounded by girls and playing with girls. You're born a boy, you prefer trucks, which is consistent with an essentialist view of gender. And we had a number of different types of test items. Okay, so what you're seeing on this graph here is uh, the proportion of parent references to gender in these um, initial language tasks that were generic. And so this took um, all gender marked speech from parents. So that could be a generic, like boys love trucks. It could be a specific, this boy loves trucks. And it also included gendered pronouns, like he loves trucks. So that's the denominator is all of gender marked speech and what parents said. And then the proportion, and then it's the proportion of gender marked speech that is generic. Okay. And then on the y axis here is uh, the number of times or the proportion of times that children endorsed essentialist leaps on items like the one that you just saw. And so what you can see here is that the more parents uh, produce generics, a higher proportion of their language that was generic, uh, the more their children endorsed essentialist views of gender. So again, this is obviously a correlational study. It on its own doesn't establish a causal connection between the generic form and gender, but it's consistent with the experimental data that I showed you. We also included some measures of stereotyped, uh, early stereotyping. So here, children are asked how interested they themselves are in activities that are stereotyped as for their own or other gender. So it looks like this. How much do you want to make jewelry? Really don't want to? Not sure. Really want to? I can make jewelry because jewelry is pretty so yeah, pick that. Mm -hmm. So in that case, children are sometimes asked items like that that are stereotypically for their own gender and are sometimes asked items that are stereotypically for the other gender, like how much do you want to build robots? And so that's these data are shown on this graph. The x-axis is the same as in the previous, the proportion of generic of gender references that were generic. And here the y-axis is how often the kids said they wanted to do the activity. The blue is for their own gender. So how often kids say they want to do the activities of their own gender uh, did not vary by how their parents, the extent of parents' um, references to gender that were generic. 
but children whose parents produced more generic references to gender expressed less interest in doing activities that are stereotyped as for the other gender. Once the children got a little bit older, so about six months after the initial session, we also included some items that get at more abstract gender stereotypes. So we told them things like this, this is John, do you think John is good at science or reading, or John is a leader or part of the team? In which case saying he's good at science and good at leader would be a gender stereotyped response. And then for other, on other items, we had things like this, this is Mary, is Mary good at science or reading? Is Mary a leader or part of the team? And so for her, saying reading and part of the team would be the stereotyped responses. So we had collected these data, uh, as I said, about six months later, uh, but linked it back to the language data that parents had produced. And there, again, the proportion of parent gender generics um, related to kids' gender stereotyping. So kids whose parents use more gender generics endorsed more gender stereotypes as well. And this is pretty notable to me because nothing in that storybook had anything to do with science or reading or being part of a team or anything like that. So this shows, you know, again, in a correlational longitudinal way, a kind of generalizable effect of parent generics on how kids are thinking about and understanding these categories. So that's all that data together, just showing that the proportion of parent references to gender that were generic related to more essentialism, less interest in activities that are stereotyped as for the other gender, and more endorsement of abstract gender stereotypes. You're probably also wondering about the content of what parents said. So remember, she also was explicitly communicating either stereotypical or counter-stereotypical um, beliefs in what she said. So she said, boys can't wear makeup you, or can wear makeup. You can imagine that other parents said boys can't wear makeup. So one might expect that that would have an effect as well. Uh, so for that, we uh, scored everything that parents said is whether it was uh, consistent with gender stereotypes or, or counter to gender stereotypes. And there's, there's no effect on any of those measures on the proportion of parent talk that is consistent with gender stereotypes. Just none. So, you know, some parents gave a lot of gender stereotype consistent talk. Only only doll, only girls play with dolls. Only boys dig for worms, that kind of thing. Some parents gave very little explicit gender stereotype consistent talk, but variation in that variable did not predict variation in their kids' beliefs about gender at all. We did find effects of the stereotype inconsistent or stereotype negating language. So saying boys can wear makeup, girls can play football, that kind of thing but not in a particularly helpful manner. So uh, how much of parents talk negated stereotypes or was directly inconsistent with stereotypes did not relate to their essentialist beliefs at all. And it actually related in these kind of backfiring way to children's stereotypes. So the more their parents said stereotype negating things, the more children were interested in activities that were only for their own gender and the more they endorsed those abstract gender stereotypes. So the content, of what parents said did not link in sort of a straightforward or intuitive or perhaps intended on the part of the parent way to how their children were thinking about the categories, um, which is again consistent with the fact that children are tr tracking a lot more of the form uh, that parents are using to talk about gender than they are to the content. Which is again consistent with the experimental data I showed you, I think especially that thing about how children don't pay that much attention to the anti-essentialist content when they hear a generic. Okay, so before I move on to the third part of the talk, which is the briefest, I know I want to leave plenty of time for discussion, um, but that wraps up a bit on the sort of overall framework of thinking about how generics are operating in communication with some data that children are tracking in linguistic form of adult speech, and that when they hear a lot of generics about a category, they tend to develop more essentialist beliefs about that category. And as I showed you in the gender study, this also appears to contribute then directly to social stereotyping. The other piece of this, though, and part of the reason that uh, I think it um, we see these effects even in parent-child conversation, um, has to do with the fact that these are knowledgeable and um, helpful people in children's daily lives for the most part. So on the idea that children are learning from generics in part because um, they are coming from knowledgeable adults and they take them as signals to how the adult is thinking about the category in sort of a deep and meaningful way, 
we should find that how children respond to generics is contingent on their beliefs about speaker beliefs and the speaker's mental states and their knowledge and their intentions and so on. So I just want to briefly show you one experiment that looked at how children's interpretation of generics varies based on their, um, their beliefs about speaker beliefs. So this was a study led by another graduate student, Kelsey Money. And in this one, we introduced children to two novel categories, RVs and quarks. And they learned about uh, features of members of the category one at a time. So let's see. Here are some more Zarpies and Gorps. Look at this Zarpy. Zarpies are good at 18 pictures. I'll move it here to remind you that Zarpies are good at 18 pictures. Okay, so they, they see examples like that. Here's some Zarpies and Gorps. Let me pick out a Zarpy and I'm gonna tell you something that Zarpy is good at. In this case, they use the generic Zarpies are good at 18 pictures. And then ask very simple test items. So do you think this other Zarpy is good at painting pictures? That should be a really straightforward yes, and that's not very interesting because you just heard Zarpies are good at painting pictures, so you should probably think another new Zarpy is painting pictures. What is kind of interesting is what the child then thinks about Gorps, because they haven't heard anything about Gorps at all. So they could think, well, everyone's good at painting pictures, so I'll just say yes too. They could think, you didn't tell me anything about Gorps, so I don't know anything about Gorps, so I'm gonna be 50-50. But if you're actively trying to make sense of what the speaker is trying to tell you, then you should sort of think about it pragmatically and say, okay, you had Zarpies and Gorps right there. And you seem to purposefully pick out that Zarpy and say, Zarpies are good at painting pictures. You are trying to tell me that Gorps are not. So in that case, you shouldn't just be, the child shouldn't just be 50-50 about whether Gorps are good at painting pictures. They should reliably say, no, they're not. Um, and that's indeed what we found. So here, the y-axis is the proportion of times they said yes, that target character is good at the thing. The yellow is the one they heard described with the generic. So they hear Zarpies are good at painting pictures, and then they're asked, here's this new Zarpy, is it good at painting pictures? And they say yes to that. Again, that's not particularly striking or surprising. The green, though, is the Gorps. So they haven't heard anything about whether Gorps are good at painting pictures, but now they're asked, and they're not just 50-50, they are reliably saying no. You know, I don't think Zarpies are good at painting pictures. And this was particular to when the speaker used the generic form. So if instead the speaker said, this Zarpy is good at painting pictures, what do you think about this other Zarpy? What do you think about this other Gorp? Then children are not reliably distinguishing their beliefs about the categories. We also wanted to sort of hone in on speaker knowledge in even a little bit more detail. So we ran a follow-up experiment where we directly manipulated whether the speaker was knowledgeable about Zarpies and Gorps. Because if you think the speaker has access to knowledge about the abilities of both Zarpies and Gorps, then it's informative if they say Zarpies are good at painting pictures and don't say anything about Gorps. But if you think they don't have access to knowledge about whether Zarpies and Gorps are really good at these things and they say Zarpies are good at it, then they don't really know anything about Gorps. So it can't be a signal to uh, the real state of the world, the real state of whether Gorps are good at this or not. That in that case, the language doesn't reflect beliefs that are informative because they're uninformed beliefs. So in that case, we manipulated speaker knowledge and I'm happy to talk more about that manipulation later. When the speaker was knowledgeable, we see the same pattern as we did before. Children assume that the mentioned category, Zarpies in this case, is good at the thing and that the unmentioned category members are bad at the thing. Um, but when they're told that the speaker isn't very knowledgeable about the categories, then those effects disappear. So again, that suggests this is not just some sort of like they hear the language, they infer this thing in a sort of dumb way. It's more that children are actively trying to make sense of what adults are trying to communicate and then making their own inferences about the world based on that. Um, and so I think this illustrates nicely that to understand the effects of generics on concepts, we have to think about how they operate in the context of actual communication. Okay. So in my very last few minutes, I want to talk about how some of this may be harnessed then for social good. So if it is the case that essentialist representations of social categories are problematic, they have, contribute to stereotyping and other um, negative intergroup phenomena in the way I've suggested based on prior work and in some of the data that I've shown you, and it's the case that generics play part of the role in the development of those essentialist representations, then can we use language to modify concepts in some way? And does that have some benefits? So we have been looking at that in the context of how um, children learn about the category of scientists as a particular type of social category. 
And we did this because we noticed that children hear a lot of generics about scientists. So they hear things, this is a quote from a real pre-kindergarten teacher in New York City, scientists have a really cool job, they think something and they create a smart thought, which, which sounds great. And we certainly hope that scientists do that. This sounds like an exciting and inclusive and exciting way to describe science to young children. We found um, in our work in the New York City schools that teachers uh, generate generic references to the category of scientists a lot when they are introducing the concept of science to young children. In fact, it's the most frequent way that they introduce the concept of science to young children is by talking about the social category of scientists using generic forms. This is also super common in children's uh, media. So this is from a popular PBS Kids TV show about Curious George. Scientists think about problems and get ideas of how to solve them. We also did a sort of large scale coding of children's media. And again, found that talking about the category of scientists as a distinct kind of person with the use of generics is the most common way that the science is introduced to young children through children's media. It's not the only way. So you could just talk about science as activities and actions that people engage in as a process as opposed to as defining a kind of person. So you see a little bit of that in there too, um, but it's less common. It's less common in what teachers say and it's less common in children's media. So in all of our work with this, including natural language coding of large samples of actual teachers teaching in the classrooms and actual children's media shows shown on TV, we have found that generic references to scientists are very, very common in what young children hear. We found experimentally that they are problematic. And, and the reason we talked to this was just based on all the work that I've already shown you today. So all of this description, generic descriptions of scientists sound positive and inclusive. But we were thinking based on the work about Zarfis, for example, that if similar processes are at play here, hearing generic references to scientists could lead young children to think that scientists are an essentially distinct, fundamentally distinct kind of person. And this could then lead one to question if you are a member of that, if you are that kind of person or not that kind of person. Um, and that if you had some reason to suspect you're not, for example, maybe you don't look like uh, what you see represented as a typical scientist, that this kind of language could lead you to disengage from trying in science, um, again, before you even get started. So that again, Again, even though the content of the language is positive and usually meant to be inclusive, it could have these backfiring effects of making children think that you have to be a fundamental particular kind of person to succeed in science. So we, we did some experimental tests of that, looking at the effects of language on children's science behaviors in the lab and found that to be the case, particularly for kids from social groups that are underrepresented in science, including gender and some racial and ethnic minority groups in the United States. We also found this language is really modifiable. So we did a teacher training intervention that I don't have time to go into detail about, but um, is published in 2020 in PNAS, where we trained pre-kindergarten teachers to use action-focused language instead of generic descriptions of scientists. And they were indeed able to do that in their classrooms and it indeed had uh, documentable positive consequences on the kids' science persistence several days after the lessons in the classroom. Um, and that those positive consequences persist over time. And that's the data I wanna show you briefly before I wrap up. So to do this, oh, there's the persist over time. We decided to do a little science intervention um, with pre-kindergarten children ages four and five using our virtual lab, where we had children learn about four science concepts over the course of about a month. Um, but we they learned about them by interacting with a programmed um, game and that we created in the virtual lab. So we controlled all the language that they heard. And we introduced them to science and particular concepts like friction and transparency and buoyancy and stuff, and randomly assigned them to learn about that using either uh, the kinds of generic references to scientists that we found to be very common in teacher language and children's media. So that's kind of like the baseline of what children hear about science anyway or in the experimental condition to hear about more action-oriented descriptions of science. So just to give you a sense of what this looks like. Hi there, I'm Curious Cat, and I'm so excited because today we are going to do science. We can do science anywhere, even at home. Okay. Sometimes leaves can be really big, but even big leaves are pretty light. Here is the first part of doing science. Part of doing science is observing things to try to understand them. Let's do science and observe this leaf with our eyes. 
So the whole lesson kind of continued like that. It talks all about the process of doing science. Let's do science by da da da. It doesn't make any generic references to the category of people of scientists. So that's our sort of experimental action focused condition. The content in the generic condition was exactly the same, um, but it just used the more typical, uh, let's be scientists, scientists do these things, um, descriptions that are more common in children's daily lives. Sometimes leaves, oops. Sometimes leaves can be really big, but even big leaves are pretty light. Here is the first part of being a scientist. Scientists observe things when they wanna understand them. So that's just scientists observe things when they want to understand them instead of doing science means observing things to try to understand them. So kids were assigned to one of the two conditions and they did four lessons about different science concepts um, over the course of a month when they were interested in doing them. And then we measured many aspects of their beliefs and behaviors over the course of the next year. The thing I want to show you about today was a measure of their gender stereotypes. So a week after their first lesson, a week after the whole curriculum, and then several months later and several months later again, we measure children's gender stereotypes about science um, like this. Here is a picture of a kid. Do you think this kid is really good at science or really good at art? I think he's really good at science. So we had kids answer questions about hypothetical boys and hypothetical girls. And what I'm gonna show you is the number of times they said boys are really good at science. Um, and then we subtracted from that the number of times they said girls are really good at science. So that if they said boys were really good at science more, they'd be higher on the y-axis. If they said girls were really good at science more, they'd be lower on the y-axis. And that's what these data are. Participant gender is um, shown over here. So orange is the girls. This identity condition is talk about the identity category of scientists using the generic. So scientists do experiments to learn about the world. Action is avoiding generic descriptions of scientists by instead saying things like doing science entails doing experiments to learn about the world. And this is the number of times that they said boys are better at science uh, subtracted out the number from I, with subtracted out the number of times they said girls were better, were good at doing science. And so what you can see here is that girls who heard the generic descriptions of scientists as an identity category endorse more gender stereotypes about science uh, over time. The effects persisted and in fact increased over time. This was in an initial sample of almost 500 children. We also did a replication study um, with another sample of 200. This one was about a 60% um, white sample of children. And so in this case, this is a sample that's entirely composed of families of color. And in both of those cases, girls endorsed more gender stereotypes about scientists if they were introduced to science uh, with the generic descriptions. Put another way, <laughs> When we avoided the generic descriptions and instead gave children action-based descriptions of science, we uh, we interfered with the development of gender stereotypes across early childhood. We successfully prevented girls from developing gender stereotypes that they likely um, would have developed otherwise. So you might be surprised and skeptical that the effects of four lessons like that would persist a year after the intervention. I think it would be right to be skeptical about that. And we were somewhat surprised about that as well. I think the reason it did that though is not just because of those four lessons. These are young children, most of them are four years old. So though all the lessons were designed for children to be able to navigate them on their own, they usually didn't. Parents were usually sitting next to them kind of watching the lessons as they unfold, which means that parents in that condition, in the, in the action focus, non-generic condition, we're exposed to a lot of role modeling of alternate ways to talk about science. And so we think what happened here is that um, we modified the way parents and kids talked about science on an ongoing basis, and that helped to sustain the effects of the intervention long after the intervention itself wrapped up. And so to test if that's the case, quite a bit after the intervention was over, we did a very mini, uh, we collected a very small sample of parent-child language data talking about science and scientists by giving them pictures like this one at a time and just asking them to talk about um, each picture. And then we coded how often parents talked about the actions of science versus the people who were the scientists um, as a category. So I'll just show you a couple examples of that. Okay, I see the next one. Do you think it's going to be another scientist? What is it? A scientist about stars. That would be a pretty fun job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
What? So I do see in this picture. She's doing science. Yeah, she's doing science. Why do you think she's doing science? Ignoring the back of the I see that she's doing science. I think you're right. So you can see parents and children talked about a lot of different, had a lot of different ways of talking. Sometimes they talked about doing science. Sometimes they talked about the category of scientists. And so here's what we found. So it's slightly confusing graph, but this is parents talking about the identity category of scientists, which remember I told you is the most common way to talk about scientists with young children, the most common in what teachers do, the most common in children's media. It's also the most common in what parents do. So parents talked a lot about scientists as a distinct category and their tendency to do that did not vary by experimental conditions. So we kind of didn't change their baseline reference to um, the identity category of scientists. But what we did change was how often parents talked about action related stuff too. So parents whose kids were assigned to the experimental action focus condition talked more about science as action than did uh, parents whose kids were in the identity language. And again, this was a very small language sample and several months after the intervention. But it does show some sort of proof of concept carryover effect uh, that participating in the curriculum might have changed how parents and kids talked about science in daily life in a way that sustained some of these effects over time. So that kind of wraps up um, this aspect of uh, the main part of the talk and that I, I wanted to share with you how widespread conceptual representations, in this case, essentialist representations of social categories can contribute to the development and maintenance of stereotypes how language, in particular generic language, contributes to the development of those things, and then how these things might be harnessed for social good. The, um, I think this is really important because it illustrates how children are active interpreters of language. It's not like language is just being dumped into sort of an uh, empty mind kind of sponge-like view of what might be happening in development. They're actively trying to make sense of why speakers are saying what they're what they're saying, and they're relying on a bunch of developmentally specific uh, conceptual and linguistic devices to make sense of that. And what that means is that sometimes adult language influences kids in ways that adults do not anticipate or intend. And so we really have to think um, and do research on how children understand language about social categories in order to make recommendations on how we could use language effectively with young children. So put another way, thinking about how language contributes to concepts requires developmental and cognitive perspectives in a really kind of deep and empirically rigorous way, uh, as well as thinking about how these processes unfold over time. I have a bunch of caveats and clarifications, but I think I'll save them for the discussion. So things that people often want to talk about and that I'm super happy to talk about, have lots of thoughts about, are questions like these. Are generics the only mechanism or even the only type of language that lead to essentialism? I don't think that's the case, and I'm happy to talk about that and how that's consistent with everything I just told you for the last hour. Oops, there's that bullet. Next one, is this an argument for colorblindness? It definitely isn't, and I'm happy to talk about that um, and how that fits with what I just said. And then can't generics describe structural relations and are those important to understand and anti to essentialism? And I also have lots of thoughts about that. So if any of these questions kind of resonate, I'll save my thoughts and arguments about them and let you bring them up and I'd be happy to discuss them. So I really want to acknowledge once again, the students that really contributed to and led all the empirical work that I showed you today, as well as our funding and everything else that supported this work. Sorry, I went slightly long, but thank you so much for your listening and attention. And I really look forward to discussing all of this with you.